In my last video, we saw that my biological age when using Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator was 32.6 years, which is 16.4 years younger than my chronological age. And similarly, when using aging.ai, my biological age was 26 years, which is 23 years younger than my chronological age. Now, these data are important because they are both four years younger than my average pheno age reduction, which prior to this test was 12 years younger, so 16.4 years younger for the test in January of 2022. And for aging.ai age, over uh, 27 blood tests since 2016, my average aging.ai age was 30 years, so this is also a four-year reduction. So what's impacting these data in terms of supplements, fitness, and diet? So first, let's have a look at supplements. And uh, the first two aren't anything new. Uh, if you've watched previous videos in this series, uh, these shouldn't be a surprise. So I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my uh, mid-20s. So I've been taking uh, levothyroxine. I was prescribed levothyroxine, 135, 137 and a half micrograms per day. So I take that every day. Also for this blood test, uh, I took methyl B12, 1,000 micrograms once every three days in an effort to limit my homocysteine, but unfortunately it didn't uh, impact my homocysteine at all. So I've got to look into my own data to see if whether I want to increase the methyl B12 amount or uh, maybe even remove it again. And then uh, a new addition to the supplement uh, stack, if, you, if, if this small amount is a stack, was for the last 10 days of this uh, period that corresponded to this blood test, uh, I included mil middle of the night mel melatonin uh, 100 to 200 micrograms per day. So I don't have problems falling asleep, but sometime after I wake up uh, in the middle of the night, uh, I have trouble going back to sleep. Uh, and the more often that I wake up in the middle of the night, it's harder to fall asleep. So uh, middle of the night melatonin has helped with that. And there is actually some interesting data uh, that may uh, show better heart rate variability and resting heart rate uh, data since I started taking it. But I don't have enough data yet to make that video, but uh, that there's an interesting story developing, so stay tuned for that. So that's it in terms of supplements. Um, what about fitness? So we're test to test uh, cardiovascular metrics, including heart rate variability, HRV, and resting heart rate improved. And if they were, could that potentially explain this four year additional reduction for these biological ages? So first, let's take a look at heart rate variability. Again, HRV for test number six in 2021 versus test number one in 2022. So uh, for blood test number six in 2021, note that each of these black dots is for a single day. And for the period that corresponded to that blood test, it was a 42, 42 day period. Similarly, a 42 day period was for blood test number one in 2022. So before going there, note that my average heart rate variability for test number six was 50.3 milliseconds. So for the 42 day period for blood test number one in 2022, my average heart rate variability was 50.9 milliseconds. And when using a two sample t-test, these two groups of data are not significantly different. So from that, we can conclude that there was no difference for heart rate variability when comparing this most recent test in 2022 with the last test in 2021. Now, before we leave the heart rate variability story aside, note that I have a couple of outlier data uh, as indicated there. Now, although I did hit a, a, a low for heart rate vari variability of 36 on, in, on another day, uh, on the, d the night that I got vaccine dose number three, so the booster, we can see that my heart rate variability went from an average of about 51 to 36. So that's about a 30% 30, 30 reduction. So we can clearly see that immune activation uh, negatively uh, affects uh, cardiovascular fitness metrics, at least heart rate variability. So what about resting heart rate? Was resting heart rate potentially improved as a, uh, uh, as a means for explaining this further reduction for biological age? So here we're looking at resting heart rate for test number six in 2021 versus uh, test number one in 2022. So starting with the data for test number six in 2021, again, a 42 day period, each dot corresponds to one day of data. My average resting heart rate was 47.2 beats per minute. Now for test number one in 2022, my average resting heart rate was 46.8 beats per minute. And when using a two sample t-test, these two groups of data are not significantly different. So from that, we can conclude that there was no significant difference for resting heart rate test to test from the last test in 2021 to the first test in 2022. And when considering the heart rate variability data, because these cardiovascular fitness metrics weren't different when comparing test number six in 21 versus test number one in 22, this likely didn't impact or imp an improvement in cardiovascular uh, fitness didn't likely impact this biological age, this further biological age reduction. Now, before leaving the resting heart rate story, again, note that there are two outliers in my data. 
And the biggest outlier with a resting heart rate of 60 was on the first night after vaccine dose number three. And then that second arrow at a resting heart rate of 51 was the second night after the, the vaccine booster. So uh, again, we can see that immune activation leads to worse cardiovascular fitness metrics, not just for resting heart rate, but again, for heart rate variability, as I showed in the earlier data. All right, so what about body different, uh, body weight? Was that different uh, from test to test as a potential uh, explanation for how this further reduction in biological age and improvement in, in the component biomarkers uh, for each of these metrics? Uh, so was body weight uh, uh, reduced from uh, test to test? So here's body weight for test number six in 2021 versus test number one in 2022. And I weigh myself every morning after I go number one and number two. So, and I record that data in an in Excel spreadsheet. So for the 42 day period that corresponds to blood test number six in 2021, my average body weight was exactly 155 pounds. And for the 42 day period that corresponded to test number one, 2022, it was 154 pounds. And when using a two sample t-test, these two groups are now significantly different. So uh, there was lower body weight for test number one in 2022 versus test number six in 2021. So body weight is affected by physical activity and calorie intake. So were those different between tests? So were test to test levels of physical activity different uh, from test number six in 21 versus test number one in 22? Now, before going into that data, note that uh, many studies frequently use questionnaires, self-report on questionnaires to indicate uh, uh, physical activity where people indicate how much physical activity that they do. And step counters are an improvement over that, but tracking steps doesn't, doesn't account for the intensity of the effort. So if I walk a thousand steps on a flat ground versus walking a thousand steps up a hill, clearly walking up a hill is gonna be a greater intensity and a greater, greater physical exertion compared to walking the thousand steps on a flat ground. So the, in contrast, the average daily heart rate is a better metric of daily physical activity when compared with both step counters and a self-report on questionnaires. So uh, my fitness tracker, and I should have mentioned that I wear a fitness tracker, I'm not gonna give them a shout out as I'm not sponsored, but for those who don't know, just leave a comment and I'll gladly uh, uh, answer which, which one that I wear. So uh, the fitness tracker also provides the average daily heart rate, so a full day heart rate, and we can compare that data for test number six in 2021 versus test number one in 2022. So for the, the last test in 2021, my average daily heart rate was 57.7 beats per minute, and for test number one in 2022, it was 57 beats per minute. Now, these two groups of data are not significantly different. Note that the p-value is approaching uh, 0.05 or less than 0.05 at 0.08. So it's close to being lower physical activity for this most recent blood test when compared with the last test in 2021. So from this, we can conclude that physical activity was not different between these two tests. Now, note that the, ex the expectation would be higher activity as a means towards weight loss, assuming that calorie intake was the same, but I was close to less active for this most recent blood test when compared with the last test in 2021. So what about calorie intake? Was test to test uh, calorie intake different? And if you've ever wanted to see a deep dive into my diet, uh, get ready because there's gonna be a lot of data about my diet uh, as a potential explanation for this further reduction in biological age and these component biomarkers that contribute to the biological age calculation. So first, average daily calorie intake for test number six in 2021 versus test number one in 2022. And note that I weigh all my food. I've documented this thoroughly in other videos, but I weigh all my food with a food scale. I then log that using an online app that I'm not sponsored by. So again, I'm not gonna give them a shout out. If anybody's curious that doesn't already know, please leave a comment and I'll gladly address it. And then I log all of that data into an Excel spreadsheet. And for each uh, period, uh, dietary periods for this, uh, test it was 42 days, I have an average dietary intake that I then line up with the blood test data. And then with enough of both data, I can look at correlations between diet with the blood biomarkers. All right, so average daily calorie intake for blood test number six in 2021 was 2373 calories per day. And for test number one in 2022, it was less at 2322 calories per day. And when using a two sample t-test on these two groups of data, they are significantly different. So from that, we can conclude that there, there was a, I significantly reduced my calorie intake for this most recent test when compared with the last test in 2021. So that then raises the que question, could a reduction for calorie intake explain some of this improvement for biological age for the most recent test versus the last test? 
So to address that, I then looked at correlations for calorie intake versus the 24 combined biomarkers on Levine's test and aging.ai. And note that Levine's test includes nine biomar biomarkers, whereas aging.ai includes uh, 19. So that uh, total is 28, but there are, there's an overlap for four biomarkers, so thereby resulting in the 24 biomarkers. So of those 24, four are significantly uh, associated with calorie intake, triglycerides, platelets, RDW, and LDL. And as we can see by the R, the little r, the correlation coefficient, a relatively higher calorie intake is significantly correlated with higher triglycerides, platelets, RDW, and LDL. And note that the N is how many blood tests that have dietary data that corresponds to each of the blood tests. So we can see for triglyc triglycerides, for example, I have 35 blood tests since 2015, since I started tracking diet. Now note that a 51 calorie cut test to test may not seem like much, but each of these four biomarkers improved from the test last test in 2021 through the first test in 2022, which is what we can see here. So triglycerides went down from 61 to 55, platelets 224 to 216, RDW 12.6 to 12.2, and LDL 86 to 75. So a very small calorie cut may have impacted these uh, imp small improvements for each of these four biomarkers. Now, calorie intake doesn't account for the macronutrient composition of the diet. So was test-to-test -test macronu mac macronutrient composition different? So for that, let's start with average daily fat, average daily fat intake for test number six in 21 versus test number one in 22. So for the last test in 2021, my average daily fat intake was about 94 grams per day. And for the first test in 2022, it was about 80, 84 grams per day. And uh, these two groups of data are significantly different. So, uh, so from that, we can conclude that there was a significantly reduced fat intake for the first test in 2022 versus the last test in 2021. So why did I do that? Why did I cut my fat intake by uh, an average of 10 grams per day? So the main reason for the dietary fat reduction for this test was to try to reduce fats and glucose. So why did I think that was going to happen? So prior to this test, glucose was my bl blood glucose levels were greater than 90 milligrams, greater than or equal to 90 milligrams per deciliter for 15 consecutive blood tests. So here we can see glucose plotted on the y-axis against time since 2015. And uh, over the past, as you can see, uh, but with the red rectangle, over the past 15 tests, glucose was greater than or equal to 90. And then adding, uh, going further, we can see that glucose was increasing over that same time, time period, which is clearly going in the wrong direction as higher glucose increases during aging and relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So to address how to reduce glucose, I then looked at correlations for macronutrients with my own uh, glucose data. And that's what we can see here. This is what the data looked like prior to this blood test. And of the, these macronutrients, uh, carbohydrate, fiber, fat, and protein, the strongest correlation with fasting glucose in my data was for fat intake. And more specifically, a relatively higher fat intake was significantly correlated with higher blood glucose. So then the next question is, was glucose reduced in conjunction with the lower fat intake for this test? So for that, uh, I then looked at correlations with uh, total fat intake with, with each of the combined 24 biomarkers on phenoage and aging.ai. And of those, there were significant correlations for uh, red blood cells, glucose, LDL, the percentage of lymphocytes, MCV, blood urea, nitrogen bun, and platelets with total fat intake. So going straight to the glucose data, uh, so now we can see that I have 33 blood test measurements in, in comparison with the 32 on the right side. Uh, so we can see that, uh, and I should also mention that the correlation for total fat intake stayed exactly the same from the last blood test to this blood test. But we, now we can see that my glucose levels for the first time in 16 tests have returned to the 80s, so thankfully. And cutting, cutting fat intake may be one factor that contributed to it, especially when considering its relatively strong correlation with fasting glucose. But cutting fat intake by 10 grams per day didn't just improve glucose. We can see that my red blood cells improved. The LDL also Im, uh, improved in association or in correlation with the reduced fat intake. And platelets also improved. Uh, as uh, in correlation with the 10 gram cut for fat intake. Now note that there was basically no change for uh, three biomarkers. So percentage of lymphocytes, 43 to 42.5 is essentially the same. Similarly, MCV, uh, 88 to 87.8, essentially the same. And blood urea nitrogen, 10 to 10, uh, didn't change test over test. So in addition to lower glucose, reducing fat intake was correlated with improved red blood cells or, or levels of red blood cells, LDL and platelets. So 
Um, all, all dietary fat is not the same. We can then subdivide fat into monounsaturated fatty acids, MUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFA, and saturated fatty acids, SFA. So which fats did I cut? So here we're looking at fat intake uh, from the last test in 2021, blood test number six, and the first test in 2022. And then evaluating statistical significance between these two groups of data, the 42-day period for blood test number six versus the 42-day period for blood test number one in 2022. So I've already shown you that the uh, fat intake was significantly different from this test when compared with the lap to the last test, about a 10 gram cut. And then uh, most, uh, most of that cut comes from monounsaturated fatty acids. So uh, 24 grams per day to about uh, 16 grams per day. And then uh, if we look just only at polyunsaturated fatty acids, there was no significant, significant difference. But when we subdivide uh, PUFA into its components, omega-3 and omega-6, we can see that I ate more omega-3, whereas omega-6 was not uh, different test to test. And similarly, uh, total saturated fatty acids were not different from test to test. So then the big question should be, why did I cut uh, monounsaturated fatty acids for the first test in 2022 when compared with the last test in 2021? And the primary reason for that is because relatively higher levels of monounsaturated fatty acids in my data were significantly associated or are still significantly associated with, uh, correlated, sorry, with higher levels, relatively higher levels of glucose, which is what we can see there. So over 33 blood tests since 2015, we can see that that correlation for MUFA with glucose is uh, increasing. So uh, that's going in the wrong direction. So that's one, the main reason why I cut monounsaturated fatty acids uh, for this test. And there's a but. So saturated fatty acid intake is also significantly correlated with higher glucose in my data, which is what we can see here. Glucose on the y-axis plotted against saturated fatty acid content in grams per day on the x-axis. And we can see that over 33 blood, uh, 33 blood tests since 2015, we can see with that correlation coefficient of 0.63, that's a relatively stronger correlation than MUFA. So sat saturated fatty acids correlation with glucose is stronger than it is for MUFA. So why didn't I cut saturated fatty acids for test number one and 22? You can see it's not significantly different when compared with test number six in 20, 2021. So note that all saturated fatty acids are not the same for their carbon chain length. For this test, I reduced cheese intake, which contains longer chain saturated fatty acids, and replaced it with coconut butter, which contains medium chain uh, fatty acids. So that's why the saturated fat fatty acids looks the same test over test, but I changed the amounts of the, uh, you know, less of the long chain saturated fatty acids and more of these medium chain uh, saturated fatty acids and coconut butter. So why did I cut cheese intake? So uh, full-fat dairy in my data is significantly correlated with higher glucose. And when I say full-fat dairy, that includes cheese and full-fat yogurt. And when we, when we look at both of these foods in a regression model against glucose, that model is sig uh, statistically significant. The correlation for those two with glucose is uh, statistically significant. And individually within that model, we can see that both cheese and full-fat yogurt are significantly correlated with higher glucose. So I may have some issue with uh, dairy saturated fatty acids that impacts my glucose levels. So uh, for this test, I reduced my cheese intake and it's been a few tests that I took out the full fat yogurt and replaced it with low fat yogurt. So also, why did I increase omega-3 intake? So a relatively higher omega-3 intake is significantly correlated with lower creatinine in my data, which is what we can see here. Creatinine on the y-axis plotted against uh, average daily omega-3 intake in grams per day on the x-axis. And as we can see by that downward trend, uh, we, there's a significant, uh, so higher levels of omega-3 are correlated with lower creatinine. And again, that's over 35 blood tests since 2015. So to test causation, I increased omega-3 for this test with uh, increasing omega-3 with more flax seeds and sardines. And note that for this test, creatinine was reduced from 1.02 on the last test uh, in 2021 to 0 0.94 milligrams per deciliter to, to this test in 2022. Now, whether that's causation, it's still unknown. I mean, uh, this is still correlation, but at least creatinine went in the right direction with this increase in omega-3 for this test. So what about differences for other macronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and overall diet composition? So in terms of mac other macronutrients, that's what we've, we've got here. So with data for blood test number six in 2021 versus the data for blood test number one in 2022 on the right, and then p-value to evaluate statistical significance. So first, in terms of total protein intake, 
uh, I reduced my protein intake by a small amount, 5.5 grams per day, and that was a, a statistically significant reduction test over test. So note that I did that on purpose because a relatively higher protein intake in my data is significantly correlated with higher glucose. So it may not just be the total fat reduction, it may also be uh, a relatively lower protein intake, a small cut, that contributed to the lower glucose for this test. Now fiber test over test was not significantly different, 86 grams in both dietary periods. I have starch indicated here, but I don't track that in my Excel file, so I didn't uh, use a two sample t-test to evaluate statistical significance between tests. But then I do track sugar intake and more specifically total fructose intake, which includes fructose obviously, but also sucrose divided by two as sucrose equals fructose bound to glucose. So my total fructose intake was, uh, I made a small reduction of 3.4 3 grams per day for this most recent test when compared with the last test in 2021. And I did that in part because a relatively higher fructose intake in my data is correlated with lower HDL, which is going in the wrong direction. Now, for this test, that 65 grams per day of total fructose may seem like a lot to many people, but for me, that's actually my lowest intake since 2015, and I love eating fruit, uh, so this is, you know, I'm going to continue to try to make small cuts over time to see uh, how low I can reduce it and to see if I can correspondingly uh, increase my HDL. And then in terms of net carbs, it was on, right on the border or pretty close to the border for statistical significance for a higher carb intake of about 10 grams for this test when compared with the last test in 2021. And that's important because a relatively higher carb intake in my data is significantly correlated with lower glucose. And again, that, may, that might seem paradoxical to many because when they think of carbs, they think of sugars, cookies, and cakes. And this is a very minor component of my diet. When I mention carbs, this is from you know, whole foods, uh, whole grains, uh, fruits and vegetables. All right, so what about differences for vitamins, uh, test over test? So we've got all of the vitamins listed here, and I'm only gonna highlight the ones that were significantly different when comparing blood test number six in 2021 versus test number one in 2022. So first, uh, thiamine intake, B1, was a little bit higher for this test when compared with the last test in 2021, most likely because of the increased barley and flax seeds, but I wasn't purposely trying to increase my B1 intake. What I did pur purposely try to uh, uh, affect was vitamin A, and more specifically, beta carotene, which is what we can see were both significantly different and a little bit lower for this test when compared with the last test in 2021. So vitamin A was about 5,000 IUs lower and beta carotene was about 2,000 micrograms lower for this test when compared with the last test in 2021. So why did I cut beta carotene intake? So a relatively higher beta carotene intake is significantly correlated with higher glucose in my data and that's over 33 tests since 2015. So again, just to reinforce this issue, it may not just have been the total fat intake, a small cut in protein, a little bit higher uh, total carb intake, and a little bit uh, a small cut for beta carotene, all of which are significantly correlated with my glucose levels, may have contributed to getting glucose back in the 80s for the first time in 16 tests. Uh, so also uh, different for this test when compared with the last test was a little bit higher of a vitamin C intake. I didn't purposely go after vitamin C for this test though, so that's just a note. Uh, a little bit higher of a vitamin D intake, and that's probably because of the small increase for sardines. But other than that, the rest of these vitamins were not different test over test. So what about differences for minerals? Uh, so that's what we've got here, all the major minerals listed on the left, and then we've got data for test number six in 2021 uh, on the left, uh, next to the minerals, and then uh, data for test number one in 2022 on the right, and then the p-value for whether these two groups of data are significantly different using a two sample t-test. So first note that calcium was uh, significantly lower for this test, and I purposely went after a lower calcium intake for this test more specifically by reducing the cheese intake. So it shouldn't be a surprise that calcium was reduced because I reduced cheese intake. And the reason I wanted to also reduce calcium, in calcium intake is because uh, a relatively higher calcium intake is also significantly correlated with uh, a higher glucose in my data. And, it, and again, that's over 33 tests since 2015. So just to reinforce that, that point, so now we've got total fat, a little bit a lower uh, protein intake, uh, a little bit lower, lower beta carotene intake, a little bit higher, higher carb intake, uh, and, and now also a little bit lower calcium intake, each of, each of which are, are significantly correlated with glucose in my data. Uh, so uh, reducing all of those, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, carbohydrate intake, may have led to that reduction in, in glucose. And then other differences that I didn't intend to uh, affect for this blood test were potassium, which was reduced by significantly reduced by 400 milligrams per day, a small increase for selenium of about 13 uh, micrograms per day, and that's likely because uh, the barley and sardines also contain 
uh, selenium, so that's probably why it was a little bit higher. I did reduce my Brazil nut intake from about five grams to four grams to account for that. So it would have been even higher if, if I hadn't uh, you know, made a small adjustment to my uh, Brazil, Brazil nut intake. And then also zinc was two milligrams lower, but again, I didn't purposely go, ask to, go after zinc for this blood test. And then the rest of the minerals, no significant difference, test over test. All right, what about differences for overall food intake? So complete food composition. So here we've got dietary composition for the top 26 foods ranked in terms of grams per day for this dietary uh, period that led to, uh, for blood test number one in 2022, when compared with the last uh, period for test number six in 2021. So atop the list for this period for the most recent test are strawberries. And again, this wasn't intentional. Um, I usually get a three berry mix from Costco that includes frozen strawberries, blueberries, and blackberries, and they were out of that. So I couldn't buy it, uh, but they did have uh, strawberries. So uh, to get my daily dose of berries, I loaded up on strawberries every day, uh, whereas in the past it was a mix of the blackberries, blueberries, and strawberries. So correspondingly, whereas strawberries are higher for this dietary period and blackberries and blueberries are lower, as indicated by the red arrows, uh, we can see that they're lower compared to the last dietary period, the last test in 2021, where blackberries and blueberries were higher. So I'm probably going to stick with the strawberries going forward just because they're a component of this uh, essentially quote unquote great data that, you know, for biological age and each of the component biomarkers. Uh, so I'm trying to keep the data the same to see if I can replicate it for the next test or keep the diet the same so I can see if I can replicate the bio biomarker data for the next test. All right, other major differences were carrots, as I mentioned, to get that very small cut for beta carotene. So I reduced carrot intake by about 20 grams per day. And then other differences were corn. As we can see, I increased it there by about 30 grams per day, which was some of that increased carbohydrate intake. So green, green arrow when compared with the black arrow on the right. And then uh, barley too. I increased my barley intake to also get a, a little bit higher of a carb intake. So to try to keep my calorie intake, you know, uh, uh, somewhere uh, uh, without making too large of a cut. So I cut my fat intake. I cut my protein intake by small amounts. So I didn't want to cut my calorie intake by too much. So I increased uh, intake of uh, corn and barley to make up some of that caloric deficit. And then also notice the increase in sardines to get more omega-3. So there was about a uh, 20 gram plus, 20 gram plus increase for sardines for this blood test relative to the last blood test. And then coconut butter, uh, which at 22 grams per day on the left, you can see it didn't make the top 25, uh, 26 foods for the last blood test in 2021. And then note that uh, conversely, uh, avocado and cheese at more than 50 grams per day for the last test in 2021 didn't make the top 26 foods for the blood test uh, that I just had uh, in January. So finishing out the diet, uh, so blood test number one in 2022 on the left versus blood test number six in 2021 on the right. Uh, note that uh, coconut butter, whereas it was 22 grams per day for this test, for the last test, it was only four and a half grams per day. So I increased it by about 100 calories per day or about 15 grams for this test compared with the last test. Now also note the avocado and cheese, which in for blood test number six in 2021 were more than 50 grams per day. To get the reduction in monounsaturated fatty acids, I mostly cut avocado. And then to reduce, as I mentioned, uh, uh, cheese intake, you can see I, I reduced it from more than 50 grams per day to only about three grams per day. And then in terms of junk, I, uh, I usually try to eat junk uh, for each um, dietary period on the day after, or imme immediately after the blood test is kind of a celebration. You know, I just had the blood test this time, eat a little bit of junk. And the day after, and after that, I shut it down. So if I don't test again for six weeks or two months, I usually shut it down in terms of no more junk uh, until the next blood test. But for this dietary period, you know, I went to go see my parents who live in New York. So when traveling from Boston to New York, we stopped in Connecticut, which in New Haven, Connecticut, they have uh, supposedly some of the best pizza in the United States. So I had a couple slices of that. So that's, that's, you know, that's an outlier. I usually don't have junk more often than once or twice after the blood test. So this is an outlier where I had a couple slices of pizza uh, for the dietary period that corresponded to this blood test. Now, also in terms of junk, as I mentioned, immediately after the blood test and the day after, uh, the junk that I've had for a few blood tests in Arona has been Nutella mixed with peanut butter, uh, you know, making homemade Reese's peanut butter cups. And although I mistakenly, uh, I forgot, I didn't add it for some reason um, for the blood test number six in 2021. So we can see I added it there. So test over test, my Nutella intake was the same with an average of four grams per day. So actually we can calculate that I ate about 170 grams of Nutella for the first two days after the blood test for each of these blood tests. Uh, so test number six in 2021, I had 160 grams, then shut it down until the next test. And then on the, the, the day of the blood test for test number one in 2022, and the day after I had, again, 
160 grams of Nutella and then didn't have anything else for the 40 uh, day period. And uh, well, yeah, I didn't have anything after that. All right, so then also note flax seeds, as I mentioned, increased omega-3 intake. We can see 14 grams for this test versus only thir three grams for test number six in 2021. And then last but not least on this list that I'd like to highlight is turmeric. So 1.8 grams for this test versus 0. Uh, 0. 0.7 grams uh, per day for test number six in 2021. So more than two and a half uh, fold increase for turmeric. So why did it increase turmeric intake for this test uh, when compared with test number six in 2021? So a higher turmeric intake is significantly correlated with lower high sensitivity C-reactive protein in my data, which is shown here. So high sensitivity C-reactive protein on the y-axis plotted against turmeric intake uh, or, or average turmeric intake in grams per day on the x-axis. And we can see that significant correlation there with a correlation coefficient of negative uh, 0.55. Um, so over 18 tests, we can see that a relatively higher turmeric intake, again, is significantly correlated with lower uh, CRP. Now, it's important to mention that no macro or micronutrients in my data for those 18 blood tests are significantly correlated with uh, CRP. And in terms of foods, only three are significantly correlated. Total nuts and seeds, which I couldn't increase for this test because I was trying to limit total fat intake. Uh, and then um, turmeric and black pepper, which also uh, I should mention that black pepper intake at 0 0.5 grams per day was also increased when compared with the last test in 2021. So uh, for, uh, that's, that could be one reason why my C-reactive protein for this test was at uh, less than 0 0.3 milligrams per liter, which is pretty low. And it's lower than my average value over those 18 tests of somewhere around 0 0.5. And last but, la, but last but not least, uh, rounding out the diet, so food number 53 for this test was cloves at 0 0.2 grams per day. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and if you made it to the end, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.